Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual program, Okada House and the Asian American Experience at Stanford, hosted and organized by the Stanford Historical Society and co-sponsored by the Stanford Asian Pacific American Alumni Club. I'm Leslie Kim, and I'm co-chair of the Historical Society's Program Committee. I want to extend a special thanks to all those of you who are members of the Historical Society for your support, which makes these webinars and our other important historical resources possible. As our members know, the Society is an independent, volunteer-driven organization devoted to the scholarship and sharing of Stanford history. And we rely heavily on membership dues and donations to keep our work going and to provide content such as what you'll be hearing today. Anyone who's interested can join the Society, which you can do on our website at historicalsociety.stanford.edu. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our first two guest presenters for today. Jacob Wong, or Jay, as he's is known to many of his uh, friends and classmates, Stanford class of 72, is a founding board member of the Stanford Asian Pacific American Alumni Club and one of the first student residents of the Asian American theme dorm when it was first housed in Unipro. He is also a founding member and co-chairperson of the Asian American Student Alliance from 1969 to 72. He helped found Nihon Machi Little Friends, a Japanese bilingual multicultural child development program located in San Francisco's Japantown. He was also the executive director and site manager for the San Francisco Unified School District's Child Development Program, primarily serving low-income and immigrant families in San Francisco. Gloria Saito, Stanford class of 73, served as training director, clinical director, and director of counseling and psychological services at UC Berkeley for 32 years until she retired in 2019. After earning her bachelor's degree in sociology at Stanford, where she was one of the first resident assistants of the Asian American theme dorm, she earned a master's degree in East Asian studies at Harvard and a doctorate in clinical and community psychology at Boston University. Serving Asian American and Pacific Islander and underrepresented students has been a focus and passion throughout her career. Welcome, Jay and Gloria. Thank you so much for being here. I will now turn it over to Jay, who will begin the presentation. First of all, I would like to thank um, Leslie for working with us um, as part of the Stanford Historical Society. It's been a great uh, collaboration uh, from SAPEC as a SAPEC board member to work with the Historical Society. This is probably our second major event. Our first event that we helped co-sponsor was the Chinese Arboretum Project. And so um, let's go into the foundation of Okada House. And so I'll kind of give the history of, of the development of um, Asian Americans. But first of all, I would like to dedicate this presentation to six individuals who first resided at Okada House. And um, the first person is Harumi Befu, who just recently passed away. He was the first uh, faculty resident fellow at Okada House, and he moved um, his wife and his two children in there. The next uh, five individuals are people who were students at uh, Okada House. Uh, the first is Alice Furumoto, who uh, uh, graduated in 74, Robert Heyman, 74, and Walden Lim in 72, Evan Chu in 75, and Alex Tseng in 73. Um, all these individuals uh, really helped create this brand new theme dorm, and we hope that uh, their presence in the dorm laid the foundation for the exploration of Asian American experience residential education. So in our presentation, we're going to be talking about five uh, goals or um, that help develop Okada House. I will be talking about the first four at the beginning of the Asian American Student Alliance, student activism, anti-war movement, and Asian American studies. And then Gloria will be talking about the last two, the cultural identity, and the change from a belief in assimilation to diversity, inclusion, and equity. Leslie's already gone through our bio. Um, on the right is a picture of our um, of um, four individuals who um, started or were part of the Asian American Student Alliance. I just wanted to shout out their name. 
to the right is Deb Leong, uh, to the top middle is Jean Tom, and to the left is uh, Chad Tanaguchi, and another person is Barbara Yasui. So these are four individuals that help uh, start Asian Ameri the Asian American Student Alliance. Okay, so it was interesting that in the late 60s and early 70s, there was no such thing or really any kind of movement or affinity to Asian Americans. And so um, initially when we were first um, came to Stanford, there were only about a hundred Asian Pacific Islander undergraduates. And the, the thought was that they should be in all the different dorms. And so we were spread out throughout the campus. And so that's probably less than 2% of the existing um, undergraduates. One of the interesting things though that happened with residential ed is that the first year that I came in in uh, 68, I moved into Robley, which at that time became a four-year co-ed dorm and also had the biggest clusters of a Asian Pacific Islander students because it was probably one of the largest dorms. So just by the mere fact of living in Robley, there was a number of Asian American students and several of us started talking and started the seeds of thinking about what it means to have um, an Asian American uh, student alliance or student group. At that time, we also connected to Nelson Dong, who didn't live in Robley, and he uh, wrote the proposal for the Asian American Student Alliance that then was approved in 1970. This is an, an article from the Stanford Daily uh, uh, documenting the first meeting of the Asian American students. And as you notice, basically it was focusing on three main ethnic groups, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans. And one of the things that we started thinking about is what kind of things do we have in common? Why should we be trying to form a student group that represents uh, these three ethnic groups and possibly other ethnic groups? Um, if you, I'm actually in this picture, I'm the one in the background in my younger years. Before ASA start, there were already two uh, ethnic student groups. There was the uh, Black Student Union and METCHA. So they kind of uh, paved the path for the Asian American Student Alliance to start. And so we did talk to them about starting our own organization. And we came up with a couple of common concerns that we had uh, with the university to meet our needs. And that included lobbying for ethnic studies, uh, creating activity centers, and having a, a, a group voice uh, talking to the university about our concerns. One of the concerns that really came up uh, during that period of time was that the university was taking a stand of, against the Vietnam War and also the invasion of Cambodia. And initially they were going to be sending a group of students, faculty and administrators to um, Washington DC. And at that period of time, we thought it was really important also for the three um, group, ethnic groups to also be represented. And so they did involve us. And so this is a picture uh, of the article that shows that uh, we were represented um, in this delegation. And I do have a friend that went on this um, delegation. And at that period of time, he actually got to meet Henry Kissinger. He didn't think it was important to meet Nixon because he didn't think Nixon was going to really talk to them in, a, in a, a meaningful way. So he went and met Henry Kissinger and talked about the Paris Peace Accords. Also at the same time, there were other Asian American groups that were organizing other different campuses. And one of the things that happened was um, there was a big uh, protest against the war. Over like 150,000 people in San Francisco came together to protest the war. And here's a picture of a number of us um, in an Asian American contingent in the anti-war protest. And this happened in San Francisco. Finally, the third area that we felt was really important is that we needed to start uh, learning about ourselves. And so we lobbied uh, for the first Asian American studies class in 1971. And this is the um, syllabus that was printed out during that period of time. At that time, there weren't um, 
any faculty that uh, were involved in Asian Americans. And so we had to seek out another individual. So we did find an individual, uh, his name is Tsukasu Matsueda, who was a high school teacher at uh, one of the local high schools that had already started teaching Asian American studies on the high school level. And then he adopted his curriculum and he led the first um, uh, class, which was the Swapsi um, class uh, during this period of time. Okay, and then uh, since then, the following year, another uh, Asian American studies class was then led by Gordon Chang, who's now the vice provost at Stanford. He has a long illustrious career at Stanford. When he taught that class, he was a graduate student, I think, I believe in history. And his class took place in the uh, lounge at Okada House. Finally, I wanted to show you a slide of how Asian Americans also started developing their own culture. And one of the highlights of uh, of developing our culture was that we were able to invite this um, folk group called Chris and Joanne. They're an LA group and uh, they and they were become be very well known among the Asian American community. And we were able to have them do a concert and the concert was done in uh, Branner Hall. Okay, so now we will pass this on to Gloria to talk about the next section. Thank you so much for including me in this presentation. Um, I feel very honored to be part of um, communicating the history of Asian American students at Stanford. And as I begin, I'd like to first of all acknowledge and express some deep appreciation for those who pioneered Okada House at the very beginning. Um, Nelson Dong, Dr. Bafu, Jay Wong, you just heard, Dan Kujiro. Um, these are some of the names that uh, stand out to me as the whole um, movement to get Asian Americans more visible on the campus began. I would also like to acknowledge Halsey Beamer, who uh, was the resident fellow at UNIPRO uh, um, during the second year of UNIPRO's existence. Um, he was a graduate student in Asian studies and um, decided that he would be willing to do this. And so he actually helped to further along the mission of um, of Asian Americans on, on the Stanford campus. As Jay mentioned, we were very few in number among a fairly large student population. Um, so we were about 100, maybe a little bit more than 100. And we were pretty diverse in terms of families being from all parts of the United States and abroad, different differences in terms of immigration and how our families got to the United States. Um, there were some generational differences as well as differences in socioeconomic background. So even though there were few of us, we were quite diverse. The large majority of us were Chinese, Japanese and Korean, um, of co Chinese, Japanese and Korean descent. Um, I myself am third generation Japanese American from Hawaii. And it was quite a culture shock to come to Stanford where um, I was one of very few because in Hawaii, Asian Americans are a large majority of the population. Um, as a result, we often felt pretty invisible, um, pretty stereotyped and not being seen for who we were. Um, I, I would sit in class and count the number of people who were not white in the class and there were very few of us. Um, and despite being a very small group on a large campus, we were able to find each other, develop friendships, make connections, and develop shared identities in terms of both personal, social, and political. Um, we sought out other students to share um, stories and to feel like we could find people who understood who we were. Um, and that was really an important part of my experience at Stanford. Um, Unipro and later Okada House provided a safe space for us to share and to explore and to celebrate our cultures, which was quite unusual in those days. In 1979, um, Unipero became Okada House. And some of you might wonder how 
um, the house got its name. John Okada was a Japanese American novelist um, who was known for his critically acclaimed novel, No No Boy. Um, no No Boy tells a story of Japanese Americans during World War II who were interned because all of the Japanese were um, placed in internment camps. And the US government required that Japanese fill out a, a questionnaire. And there were two questions on the questionnaire. Um, the first was, are you willing to serve in the US armed forces? The second one was, um, do you swear unqualified allegiance to the US and def defend the US from all attacks? And there were, most people said yes to those questions. There were, uh, there was a significant number of primarily men who said no to both questions. And these were called no-no boys. And they were imprisoned during the war because um, number one, they weren't willing to serve in the military. And number two, they weren't swearing allegiance to the US. So Okada House actually honors both John Okada's bravery in telling this story, as well as the Nono boys who were able to stand up and have a voice in spite of the costs to their, their own lives. Um, and I actually think it's a very fitting name for Okada because in life, many of us, including many API uh, folks and students have to stand up and have our voices and be heard. And so in a way, promotes that idea that it's important for us to have our voices. All right, so Okada House or Yunipero, as I said before, really nurtured and encouraged unique opportunities for us to share our personal, cultural and political um, lives. Um, early on in, in the history of Okada House, a tea house was created. And um, so late at night you could go and you could get ramen or bao or tea. And the funds that came from the sales of these food items were, were donated to things such as the Asian Health Clinic and the International Hotel, um, which International Hotel actually doesn't exist anymore. But back in the 60s and early 70s, it was um, a place where many of the workers who had, the Asian workers who had come to the US to to help with building the US uh, were housed there. Um, in addition to the tea house, we had a lot of house events, which included um, cultural sharing, discussions about Asian American identity, political and social events. Um, and there, so there were opportunities for, for many, many things to happen. This is an example of um, a calendar of events from the winter, so January of 1973. This was the year that I was an RA at, um, at Unipro Okada. And this is just a snippet, but if you take a look, there were many events, multiple events that happened every week. Um, and some of them were focused on Asian Americans. For example, um, there was a multimedia presentation on the Japanese relocation. Um, we had an Asian American discussion group on image and identity. Um, we had birthday parties, we had dinners out, um, we had study breaks, we celebrated uh, people's birthdays. Um, so it was a way for the community to come together to both learn about each other. Uh, there was also something on the San Andreas Fault so that not all of the events were focused on Asian or Asian American issues, but it was a chance for everyone to get together to learn about really important issues. I, I have to say also that um, at that time, I think it's different today, but at that time, 50% of the students who lived in Unipro or Okada were of Asian descent and 50% were not. So it was truly a multicultural experience. So I wanted to show you a couple of pictures that um, actually showed what it was like. So there were a lot of um, times when people were hanging out and some of you might recognize yourselves in these pictures, um, hanging out in each other's dorms. Um, cooking was a favorite thing, um, making um, Asian food or not Asian food, but sharing and, and being able to, to do all of that together. Um, 
<clears throat> so in addition to deeper discussions about identity and uh, history and political events, we also did some things that really facilitated the, the building of the community and camaraderie. Parties, parties, parties. <laughs> we had a lot of parties and I, I picked this slide deliberately because it showed how diverse the group was that, that lived at Unipro during that year. And I think um, Lee Salisbury is in this picture. He was one of the residents. He's also on the panel today. So um, say hi to Lee there. And um, I wanted to show you a picture. I found a picture of Lee Salisbury on the left um, in the lounge where everyone was hanging out, um, being together. And on the right side is a picture of myself with um, a, a fellow resident, um, Sue Rice. So this is what we, we looked like back then. We don't look like that anymore, but um, it's been 50 years. So um, I wanted to, to say a few words about Okada's contributions to professional and a, a personal identity development. Um, the implementation of Unipro was a really important validation for our significance as a group of students. Um, we were no longer invisible because we had a place, because we, the university considered it important enough that we had a community that, that we could build. Um, it was one step in helping us to deal with our sense of isolation, where we could be among other people who shared and understood our experiences. It also enabled us to value and to be proud of the cultures that we came from. Um, I, I mentioned that I was um, from Hawaii where it's very diverse and being on the Stanford campus felt very isolating. And also um, it, it felt to me like, oh my gosh, does my voice count? Um, who am I? I'm just a, a little Asian girl who shouldn't necessarily speak up because that's not how people see us. And yet, um, so Okada was really important in helping us to, to be proud of who we were and to, to give voice to those things um, and to, to be able to share and to contribute to the campus um, and beyond. I think it was really important that it was um, a multicultural dorm because in a way we were able to share and gain insight about, about ourselves. We also had the opportunity to gain insight from other people that lived in the dorm and to, to help them to grow and learn and be able to um, embrace identities beyond their own. Um, so I think from my perspective, it was a really important beginning. And I emphasize beginning because um, certainly in life, there's, there are many, many, many steps. Um, and this was something to be really proud of. So from assimilation to DE, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, as I said, Okada was the beginning of a, a very slow and evolving process. I don't think there is ever an end point. I think we are always continuing to evolve and develop. Um, I know that Okada was very important in terms of my own shift in values from what we might consider the ideal of assimilation, you know, learning how to survive on this campus, being more like the majority of the students who are there, to the valuing of our unique perspectives and cultures. Um, so we had both the ability and the obligation to give voice to who we are, to share our values, to promote the things that we thought were important. Um, and Okada also began to give us a deeper understanding of the historical roots of oppression and racism, self-devaluation and, and internalized racism, which all of us have. Um, again, I emphasize beginning because um, it's important that we don't see this work as ending, particularly in this day and age where um, some of these issues continue to come up and raise, um, raise questions for all of us. Um, the, other, the other thing that I think is really important is that, um, and, and Jay has said this as well, that um, our experiences in developing and being part of this early history enabled many of us to pursue work 
both professional and personal towards inclusion and greater equity. Um, for myself, um, what it enabled me to do ultimately was to pursue a career that enabled me to, to help people to grow personally. So, so um, after a long history of de trying to do many things, I ended up becoming a psychologist. And I think the roots of that um, were in my being an RA at Okada House. So again, I would like to thank um, Leslie and the Stanford Historical Society for giving us this opportunity to um, give voice to some of these really important issues. And um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gloria and Jay, for that wonderful presentation um, and for giving us some of the background on the foundations of Okada House. Um, as we all know, Asian Americans have existed at Stanford since its founding. Um, but, uh, you know, there were, I think, definitely so many strides that were made in the 60s and 70s, um, including yourselves and your classmates that really uh, brought these issues to the forefront and allowed the Asian American student community to really come together um, uh, in a way that it really hadn't before. Um, and so now I want to uh, bring on our two other panelists who are with us today. Um, we have Lee Salisbury, Stanford class of 73, whom some of you saw uh, in a younger version in, in some of those photos that Gloria shared. Uh, he was a resident of the dorm during its first two years from 1971 to 73. He later attended USC Law School and has been a practicing family law specialist for the past 45 years in Pasadena. His two children are Stanford alumni, including his daughter, Katie G. Salisbury, Stanford class of 2007, who is active in the Stanford Asian Pacific American Alumni Club as well, and recently co-authored an op-ed in the Stanford Daily with Jacob Wong and others about the interconnections between Stanford and Asian American history. And we're uh, delighted to have Edwin Carlos, uh, Stanford class of 2020, so one of the more recent residents. Uh, Edwin was an ethnic theme associate at Okada House from 2018 to 2020, organizing weekly workshops, presentations, and discussions with residents, faculty, and community organizations. He is now pursuing a school psychology PhD at UC Berkeley with a focus on Asian American ethnic racial identity attitudes. So uh, for our questions, uh, I'd like to start with uh, Lee and Edwin, since we um, have just heard from Jay and Gloria. Uh, so maybe Lee, you can start us off with, um, can you share your personal experience of living in an Asian American theme dorm, how you came to live there? Um, did you know that you were moving into uh, an Asian American theme dorm and how has it shaped and influenced your time, um, both when you were a student and beyond? Well, um... I sort of uh, ended up in Unipro um, by chance. I was uh, overseas during the first part of 1971 in my sophomore year. Um, and uh, when I came back in the summer, at the end of the summer of 71 from overseas, uh, at that time, Stanford had a severe uh, student housing shortage. A lot of people were not able to get into housing and had to live off campus. And there was a lottery that was uh, uh, handled by the university for housing. And so um, I was uh, just kind of in the mix and was thrown into uh, Unipro. Um, I didn't really know anything about it till I got there. Um, and that's so it was just purely by chance uh, that I was there. Um, I wasn't part of the development of it, although I knew some of the people who were involved from my freshman dorm. Um, Dan Kajiro was mentioned earlier. He was a good friend of mine in, in my freshman year. So that's that's how I ended up in, in Unipro. Um, it turned out to be a really uh, great experience for me. I uh, was uh, more or less a new group of people. I knew a few people who were there. Uh, I made uh, many, many friends. Um, many Asian friends, uh, many non-Asian friends. Um, it was a very uh, comfortable place for me to live. I chose to live there for two years, um, actually lived in the same dorm room, although I had different roommates the two years. Um, it, it, sort of ironically, the I had a great experience overseas. I was in France 
but the particular group I was in in France socially was very cliquish and there was sort of an in group and an out group and uh, it wasn't uh, quite, it wasn't very comfortable socially in a lot of ways. And even though it was um, not, well, it was not nearly as diverse as uh, Unipro, Unipro turned out to be a much more comfortable place for me uh, to be there. Uh, I came from a, unlike Jay and Gloria, obviously I'm not Asian. I came from a small town in Oregon, um, which was uh, almost the definition of non-diverse. Um, if you saw a person of another race there, you kind of did a double take. They were probably uh, passing through. And so um, these were very new experiences for me, but um, I really enjoyed being there. Great, thank you, Lee. And Edwin, if you can also answer the same question um, and share a little bit about your personal experience of living at Okada um, and how it shaped and influenced your time as a student and beyond. Obviously you, you're um, still studying uh, Asian relations um, and, and carrying that on in, into your post Stanford uh, research. And also maybe you can talk a little bit about what, what the role of an ethnic theme associate um, is. Yeah. Thank you so much, Leslie. Honored to be here with you all. Um, and I'll start off by saying I really loved and cherished my time living in Okada House during my junior and senior year when um, I was an undergraduate at Stanford. And I came to Stanford very interested and very um, gung ho about getting to know more about my identity and saw student organizations on campus like PASU, the Philippine American Student Union, and the AQC, the Asian American Activity Center, as some great places for me to explore some of those identities. I came from rented Washington, but before lived in uh, Oahu, Hawaii, so um, some connection there. And the culture shock of moving from predominantly Asian American, also Philippine American neighborhood in Hawaii to Washington brought up a lot of those questions of identity for me to seek out these spaces on campus. And the moment that I heard about Okada House, I lived all across campus at the, the new dorm Meyer um, in Lagunita Ports. I found myself in Okada House nearly every week, almost even every day, uh, visiting people who lived there. Um, I was what uh, people called uh, a muggle or someone that came to live in, um, hang out in Okada a bunch, but didn't actually live there. And we had many people who saw Okada as a home, even if that wasn't their actual dorm space. And I um, decided to apply to be an ethnic theme associate with Okada House. For those who don't know what an ethnic theme associate is, uh, it's a um, position that focuses on uh, Asian American education and uh, development within Okada House to provide um, opportunities within the dorm to have conversations about Asian American identity, political issues, and as well as engage with the other ethnic themed dorms and communities on campus and uh, across the Bay Area to talk about Asian American identity and to understand what that looks like for us today. And I really loved this role. I was an ethnic theme associate for both my, time, my years in Okada, my junior and senior year. And each time I found myself learning so much more about the Asian American identity and how much um, uh, history there is to the term all the way back to 1968 when Yuji Chioka and Emma G coined the term at UC Berkeley where I'm at now and seeing all of the work that uh, Asian American students did on campus to create that space of Okada House, the AQC and all these student organizations to organize for more Asian American students to uh, be admitted to campus. I, um, I didn't know this until my junior year that um, a bunch of Philippine American students as a part of uh, PASU um, organized and rallied for more Philippine American students in particular to be admitted to campus. And the number of Philippine American students in the early 2000s jumped up exponentially since then. And so I look back to all of the uh, organizers and all the people who made this space of Okada House and made my opportunity to attend Stanford possible with all of that work. And so I'll close off by saying I really love um, the opportunity to engage in 
Asian American identity and the deep uh, heterogeneity within the Asian American identity, how important it was to engage across groups in solidarity with um, Latinx folks and the deportation issues facing Southeast Asian and lots of um, Latinx people and also um, interrogating anti-Blackness in the Asian American community. All these different topics that we discussed in my time as an EPA were very valuable to me. Wonderful, thank you, Edwin. Um, Jay, do you want to touch a little bit? I know you um, have touched on your personal experience, but maybe you can also speak to um, kind of how, since you were there at the very beginning, how many Asian students um, lived there at the beginning? Was there a system for having Asian students versus non-Asian students in the dorm when it first began? Okay, so I moved in uh, my senior year there, and there were probably, I mean, it was an interesting group of uh, people. There were probably maybe about um, five or six of us that were pretty active in the Asian American Student Alliance, and we decided that we wanted to move in there because we felt it was important to, you know, to develop a community. And it was also important in that period of time is that uh, during that time, we used to have what was called the clubhouse, um, where we was kind of like our office area. And that's where we had our first class. But then uh, that clubhouse was uh, demolished to make way for the um, law school. And so we no longer had a place for Asian Americans to hang out. Outside. So that was really important. And that's why the dorm and the tea house really became the hub for where Asian Americans could hang out because there weren't any other places. There was no AQC, there was nothing like that around and there were no staff or anything. So it was all student driven. Um, I would say that what was really nice is that then people from different places, uh, different kinds of concerns could be in one area. I mean, there were people that were really very politically active in the student movement, they were demonstrating and so on. And uh, there were people that just wanted to hang out. One of the interesting things that came out was that um, whatever reason, Asian Americans like to be very competitive in sports. And so we started participating in a lot of intramural things and the sidebar with a spinoff was that uh, we, we developed an organization that, that uh, recruited people from all over campus to play and our teams and, and about five years down the road, um, we won the intramural championship and, uh, and the fraternities were really upset because how come a bunch of Asian Americans beat us at, 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 at these um, um, at physical athletic events. Um, I didn't uh, meet a lot of friends over there. I still continue seeing them a lot um, whenever, and even people who haven't I seen, we still can develop a report. So for example, I haven't seen Gloria in uh, 50 years, but <laughs> it's just like, it was only like, <laughs> only like a little while ago that we were, weren't around. And so it's amazing how quickly we can relate to each other and see how um, our experience really shaped a lot of parallel um, interests of uh, how we raised our family, what our uh, priorities were and so on. So um, it did create a network and I still think it's probably one of my most important networks for both um, my career and personal life is the uh, network uh, that I created in the community that I developed at Okada House. Wonderful, thank you, Jay. And uh, Gloria, if, I, I know you referred to um, sort of how this experience really um, fed into what you have been doing uh, since then. Um, so if you want to also touch on perhaps maybe the angle of being an Asian American woman um, and how perhaps that um, informed your experience of living at Okada House or just made you aware of, of different things and perhaps some of our other panelists had experienced well, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I think I think being at Stanford was a fairly daunting experience for me. Um, you know, today we might call it imposter syndrome, but back then it was the question of, am I good? How did I get here? Am I good enough to be here? Um, am I going to be able to make it here? And look at all these smart people and, um, and look at all of these activists like Jay and Nelson. 
Um, my dad said to me during the Vietnam protests that I should not go out and protest, but I should stay in my dorm and study. So this was the, the focus of um, my family. And so I think being able to, number one, make friends with folks who weren't necessarily exactly like me, but who had grown up, my, one of my best friends in college, um, Gail Aoki, some of you might know her, um, she and I shared a Japanese American background. And so that was really important. And being another Japanese American woman, um, that provided me with a lot of comfort. The, the ironic thing is that people would get us confused. Her name is Gail, my name is Gloria, and they would always call us by each other's names. And, um, you know, back then it was a little disconcerting. Now we have greater insight into what all of that was about. But um, so that was really a challenge. I think um, being applying for and being um, the resident assistant at UNEPRO was an incredibly pivotal time for me because number one, I got selected to do that. And for me, it felt like a long shot. Like I don't have the confidence to do this. I don't have the capacity to do this. But during the course of that year and being able to take leadership, let me see that I could in fact do things and that I was in fact smart enough. I mean, it's, it's hard even for me to say that now, but um, the fact that I could um, bring my own perspective to it, that I didn't have to be like everybody else in order to be good enough. Um, and, you know, you can hear me talking, it sounds like I, I sound like a psychologist, which I am. Um, but I think it really did help me to pursue a, a, a path, excuse me, a path. <laughs> so, Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, I wanna bring it back to um, sort of looking uh, obviously between uh, Jay and Gloria and Lee and then to Edwin, there's um, sort of a, a gap of years um, and there were amazing activities, um, things that Okada House was really instrumental in creating. Um, I kind of wanna go back to the very beginnings um, uh, kind of in the early 1900s and 1910s, um, Asian, I don't know if people are aware of it, Asian students at Stanford um, had also organized separate housing on campus, not so much um, as an ethnic theme dorm, but really just to provide safe spaces for their communities due to racial tensions and violence um, that was being committed against them by some of their fellow non-Asian students. Um, and over the years, uh, there have been sort of some voices um, kind of percolating expressing or just sort of questioning what the purpose is of an ethnic theme dorm. Um, is it not more divisive to have people of the same uh, sort of group live together? Doesn't, isn't that more exclusive than inclusive? And I just wonder, um, maybe, maybe Lee and Edwin, since you sort of um, are kind of can bookend um, the history of Okada House, maybe each of you could sort of answer that. Lee, from the perspective of having being a non-Asian person who lived in, in the dorm and then Edwin sort of seeing it from, from this end and, and how more current Stanford students and how the Asian American community at, at Stanford um, is now and, and how you see the role of an ethnic theme dorm evolving. Well, uh, from my perspective um, at the time, the purpose, uh, the driving purpose of the uh, theme dorm was what Gloria and Jay have explained. I mean, they were part of the group that uh, uh, lobbied for it and made it happen. And so um, I was somebody who just kind of uh, came along for the ride, uh, but it's had a tremendous impact on my life. Um, like Jay expressed, I have uh, made uh, many lifelong friends from Unipro who I still am in well, just tremendous contact with. And I could talk about uh, one of my friends who I think is listening. We had a long conversation on Sunday. Um, so it's had a huge impact on my life. Um, my wife, uh, although she wasn't at Stanford, is Asian. My children are half Asian. My daughter is uh, very involved in um, in the Stanford, uh, in the SAPAC. Uh, she uh, has become uh, sort of buds with Jay, actually. 
and um, was visiting Jay, I think, a week or so ago. They drove down to Stanford together uh, for uh, some activities. So um, it, it's had a huge impact on my life. It's had a huge impact on my um, career, I think. Um, Jay and uh, Gloria and I are in different ways, have been involved in um, professions that uh, deal with people uh, very intimately. Um, because of uh, where I live in Southern California, I've had lots of clients and associates who are Asian. And um, so uh, I, I derived a lot from that experience as a non-Asian person. And I think it's uh, shaped me in very positive ways uh, throughout my entire life. I, and I don't, I've never felt that there was a exclusion or inclusion sort of situation, at least there. I don't know, and the things may have developed differently with Edwin and other people or at, at different times, but um, I felt that that was a very inclusive and not exclusive place to be. Thank you, Lee. Yeah, Edwin, do you wanna add to that perspective? Yeah, I, um, I love hearing your perspective, Lee, and that's an experience that a lot of students still continue to have in Abada House since I was a staff member there um, a few years ago. And the um, most important piece I found to having that kind of experience in Okada House was a willingness to engage with other people and other cultures and to uh, be humble towards experiences that uh, people did not have. And that occurred for non-Asian, students and even for Asian students as well in Okada House. And for me being um, an ethnic theme associate in the dorm and creating opportunities for these conversations about what are some similar connections can we make between our experiences and how can we extend that in acknowledging how the um, racial tensions in the country and other pieces make wanting to find comfort within your identity and find ways to engage outside of it, however that looks um, possible within the dorm space. And as um, the Asian American term and the Asian American community continues to grow and evolve, the opportunity to, again, as I um, mentioned previously, engage in the heterogeneity of the Asian American term and the people within that uh, demographic I think was a very valuable experience for non-Asian people to also see that the uh, Asian American identity and the stereotypes that you might have towards that are uh, oftentimes not true. And there's a huge expanse of Asian American people to learn about and understand. And so the, there are many people that came um, with that interest. And there are also people who um, also came into Okada House with less of an interest in engaging with that. And that was okay, and we were very willing to meet them where they're at with what they want to engage with. And I found that and, um, a lot of people found that the push for uh, dorm space that were um, not 50% Asian frosh and a non-Asian frosh was a big piece the past few years to where now that 50% uh, frosh rule isn't in place anymore. And in talking to a few uh, current Okada um, staff and residents, that has been another uh, benefit in, again, engaging in that heterogeneity of the Asian American experience and having primarily Asian American students to engage in that who want to live in Okada House. And um, that was me when I first came to Stanford. I uh, had ranked Okada House, but was not placed in Okada House my first year. And I wonder how that would have changed my own experience if I were immediately put into Okada House. And so I'm glad that people have the opportunity now. And I'm curious to see how that um, interest in that multiculturalism and engagement is happening today. And so that's an encouragement for people to talk to current Stanford students and to see what kinds of opportunities there are today. Fabulous, thank you, Edwin. Um, my last question, I think, before we move on to some questions from our audience members um, is for both Gloria and Edwin, since you um, have spent some time at a non-Stanford campus across the Bay, um, 
just how you have seen perhaps similarities and, and, and a contrast in either the Asian American student experience or how um, Asian American student culture uh, has been addressed on, on both campuses, obviously understanding that they're quite different in terms of size and, and how um, residential, um, uh, how the students are housed um, on the two campuses. But I don't know if you can just speak to that, um, uh, each of you, maybe Gloria, you can start. Um, well, <clears throat> so I joined um, the staff at Berkeley in 1987. So that's a long time ago. And um, I think there are many differences between Stanford and Cal, obviously. Um, population, student population at, at Cal is huge. And I think represents a lot of diversity. Um, I, I was there 32 years, much, a lot of diversity in terms of ethnic racial diversity across all kinds of um, dimensions, socioeconomic diversity as well, even though there was some of that at Stanford as well, it's much more pronounced, I would say, at, at Cal. Um, early on in my time at Cal, there were already some student development offices that were geared to serving students from different um, ethnic groups, ethnic racial groups. <clears throat> so African-American student development, Asian-American student development, Chicano Latino student development, um, re-entry students, students who are older than 25, lots of diversity um, encompassed across the campus. And so I think um, the challenge has been to be able to serve the needs of all of that diversity and to provide appropriate, um, not just counseling, but academic um, advising, uh, other kinds of financial and other kinds of support for that, for that diverse student population. Um, so I think, um, you know, I was really honored to work at Cal for that long. And um, part of what I really value and, and appreciate about it is, is that level of diversity, that you get to support students who um, otherwise might not have made it. Whereas at Stanford, there is a sense of a little bit of privilege to say, <laughs> to, to um, and, where the supports might be there because there is more, it's a school that has more financial capacity. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. Yeah, no, it did. Yeah, Edwin ha you. might have a different perspective on that. Yeah, thank you, Gloria. Um, I can speak to uh, my experience working um, at the Asian Pacific American Student Development Center, um, as Lori mentioned on the campus. I am uh, been working there for the past two years as a graduate student coordinator and um, learning about how much the resources for uh, Asian American uh, students have grown and also how they have understood the different ways that Asian American students can identify on campus. Um, the APOSD office, as I'll call it, um, is made up of three different arms, the Pacific Islander Initiative, the uh, SWAN Initiative, so that um, South Asian, West African, and um, Southwest Asian, and the um, Asian American, uh, APA, the Asian American uh, Political Activation Program. Uh, these three offices within the APOSD office have been very new in the past few years at Cal. And so the resources are starting to come for um, students of Asian descent and Asian connection on campus. And we're finding that it's been hard to figure out the ways to engage students on campus with how difficult Cal classes are and how big classes are, the deep pressure to perform well versus learn about your self and your identity. Those opportunities are, um, are still in the process of creating for students on campus. And so um, it's fun to be a part of that now and to help uh, particularly with the APA program to learn about students on campus and also how many students identify as international students across um, the campus that uh, how different that experience might be for Asian American students who are second or third generation in the country. So it's a very new ground that we're learning more about. The other, the other thing that I would like to add to that actually, and you're alluding to it 
um, Edwin, is just the tremendous diversity and the growth in diversity over the last since over the last 50 years and the time since the time that I was at Stanford. So now what you're getting is a lot of um, children of folks who came from Southeast Asia back in the mid 80s, um, post Vietnam War. Um, and as you said, West African, there are so many different folks who are coming from all over the world. And um, the challenge of being able to be culturally appropriate and to serve such a diverse group of students is really tremendous. But there is m way more diversity than back when Unipro started when we were largely Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Um, so there's a lot of um, challenge to that. It's also enriching in ways that we could not have imagined 50 years ago. Fantastic, thank you, uh, Gloria and Edwin. Okay, um, well, we have a few questions that have come in from our audience um, that I can ask all of you now. And so for those of you who haven't submitted a question but are interested, um, now is the time. Just click that little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, again, you, you won't see the question um, of others uh, that'll just be visible by our staff, um, but we'll try to get to um, all the questions that we can. Uh, so the first, well, it's not so much a question. We have a comment from Edison Lee, who just noticed, uh, I think, on that calendar um, that uh, that was shown about the birthdays and how could how could they be surprises if they were published? <laughs> Which, um, but you know, it's great that those birthdays were on there um, to to celebrate and remember. Uh, Lisa Chung asks, um, or sort of has a comment on a question seems like it would be helpful to describe the reason why the no-no boys answered no to those questions. Um, what, it was an important debate back then that goes directly to the heart of the notion of being quote unquote the other and questioning their loyalty. Um, I don't know if, uh, Gloria, if you have anything to add on to that or. Well, <clears throat> if you take a look at, um, at the book and take a look at some of the history around it, I think it was a real dilemma for some folks and the, the folks, the, the men who said no and no, didn't feel like they could disavow their heritage, number one, um, and couldn't disavow it, particularly in light of the fact of how they were being treated um, during the war, being incarcerated. And um, so I think that that was a real dilemma and it took a lot of courage, I think, to be able to say, to answer no to each of those, that they weren't going to, to be part of the <clears throat> the military when um, they were being denied their rights as citizens, and many of these were citizens. Um, so I think it, it was a very difficult and contentious and conflicted choice that these folks made at great cost. Um, yeah, I mean, a number of the four, four, I mean, the no-no boys that were then um, put into separate uh, relocation camps like Tule Elk. Tule Lake. Um, they were Tule Lake Tule. was the place where a lot of the Nono boys were put into camp because they said they weren't going to participate in the military. But on the flip side, you know, there's also a lot of uh, Japanese Americans, especially Hawaiian Americans, volunteered to join the army. You know, there's the 442 Regiment, which, which is the most uh, decorated uh, brigade of, of any American regiment. And they participated uh, uh, strongly in the European arena and, and did a, a lot of amazing things to protect um, the country. So, I mean, people showed in different ways how they could be loyal to the country, but also understand that uh, the, the country did not treat them well in that situation. Okay. Okay. That's unfortunately true for, <clears throat> I think, quite a bit of, of history and, and, and other groups as well. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have come in from people, and actually I don't know if any of us will necessarily know the, the, the answer to this, but um, did the fraction of undergraduate students who were Asian American increase? Uh, specifically, this person's asking after Fred Hargadon served as uh, Dean of Admissions, um, and I think his, his tenure started in 1969. Um, and then sort of what is the ethnic makeup of Stanford currently, I think specifically um, around Asian American uh, students. I don't know if anyone knows the answer to okay. that. I mean, obviously it's increased. <laughs> yeah, so um, when it dramatically went up was in the mid 80s. So there was a student mm -hmm. named Jeffrey Al, mm -hmm. 
who did a analysis showing that the mission rates were discriminatory against Asian Americans. And so that they had like higher SAT scores, higher GPAs, and they, he brought that into light uh, to the missions office. And like the reply was that they had this thing called leadership, you know, ability and so on. So that dramatically changed uh, when he brought that up. And that's when it started going to 15%. Presently, my understanding, it hovers between low 20% right now. That also also reflects the dramatic increase of Asian Americans within the general population. So in the 70s, it was only 1.5 Asian Americans in the United States and like 20 Americans. So it's reflective of the increase of Asian Americans within the U.S. But it, it's kind of, but it is disproportionate in the sense of the overall percentage and it does bring up into other questions about what, or whether Asian Americans are overrepresented in the higher institutions. And there are some issues about that whole thing about the equity issue. Okay, there's a, let's see, a, a comment, I think from uh, someone that all of you might know, uh, Dean Knapp, uh, who just uh, sort of sends a shout out that likely uh, I was a random white guy who got thrown into Unibro in the fall of 1971 because of the housing draw. Um, quite a new experience to be hanging out with 20 or so of my closest friends and then realize I was the only non-Asian American uh, in the group. So, I, I remember Dean uh, a couple doors down on the first floor. So, uh... <laughs> And uh, Dan Kojiro uh, chimed in and has a question specifically uh, for you, Lee. You compared your experience at Unibro with your overseas groups. Uh, how do your experiences at Arroyo, a freshman all-male dorm, compare with your time at Unibro? Well, uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, <laughs> so Dan and I were both uh, freshmen at Arroyo. Um, and so then a couple years later, we moved over around the corner to Unipro at, at Wilbur. So Dan was a good friend of mine as a freshman and also at Unipro. Uh, Unipro was at that time, um, and I think it was kind of the end, near the end of um, having exclusively male and exclusively female uh, freshman dorms and dorms in general. So Arroyo was an all-male freshman um, a dorm, and um, my roommate at uh, Royal was Edison Liu, uh, and uh, so that was sort of my first uh, introduction into uh, Asian American culture. He and his family were incredibly uh, welcoming to me. He lived in San Francisco. You know, are the closest of friends, and then Dan also was a very close friend of mine. He was on the third floor, uh, so. Both of those experiences were different, but they were really good experiences. The best living experiences I had um, were at Arroyo and at Unipro when I was at Stanford. Uh, and both of those groups, even though there was some diversity, not the kind of diversity now that uh, we're talking about, um, they were very cohesive groups. Everybody, I think, I, Dan would have to answer the question for himself, but I think everybody felt part of the group and uh, regardless of where they were, were from. And so even though the makeup and the purpose of Unipro was a lot different, uh, the way I felt there and the the way I felt like I was part of the group and making lots of friends and many of whom are lifelong friends. I know Edwin, you're a recent graduate, but I think you can look forward to having the kind of friends that we have had over these years uh, is really the enduring um, part of my family, my Stanford experiences, all of those connections that were made that have lasted all of my life. So I'm not sure that really answers the question. Yeah. No, no, it did. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Um, no, it's, it's, I think, fascinating to have the, the perspective of someone who um, sort of fell into this and, and had this experience um, from a non-Asian perspective and, and that it was valuable to you, um, which is wonderful to hear. Uh, we have a couple of questions for Edwin. Um, 
Uh, the first comes from Cindy Ng, who asks, uh, why is it important for current and future students to know the history of Okada? And how has Okada and the larger Asian uh, American community at Stanford, um, or how was it created and built by students for students? And how can this um, education on the history of Okada be done in an ongoing way? Um, maybe you can, that sort of speaks to, I think, what, what your role was um, as a theme associate there. Yeah. Um, it's great to hear from you, Cindy. Hope you're doing well. Um, and yeah, I um, really believe in the importance of learning about this history and the continuing uh, programs like this for people to learn about the deep uh, Asian American history at Okada House. Because as I mentioned earlier, the Asian American community, the demographic and the uh, term itself is continuing to evolve and grow today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Asian American term came out of the Third World Liberation Front and as a political term to bring together uh, people with similar experiences to um, push for social change in the university, in the country, and that still exists today. And without that knowledge of that political history and the deep ways that we are connected together with that experience, then there isn't a, um, a baseline point or an anchor point for people to understand their identity and where to go next with these experiences. And that's a point of emphasis I had in my time as an ethic theme associate. Um, there are many resources that we inherited on the Okada and Asian American community timeline uh, that previous ethic theme associates and uh, community members created. And all of this informed our desire to understand what's next, given, again, I mentioned the deep um, uh, racial tensions in the country and how um, the Asian American demographic is constantly changing on the campus and in the country. And um, some ways to uh, continue this effort uh, ongoing is for, for students on campus to engage with the AQC, with Okada House, and for the continuous support um, of the university for Asian American students and Okada House. Um, there's this one program I didn't mention that was my favorite program during my ethic themed associate time in Okada um, that we started called Taste of Okada. And this was an opportunity for students um, in Okada House to cook food and share stories about their uh, families, their lived experiences in the form of uh, home and food that they could share with everyone. And these were my favorite opportunities to learn about people's cultures and identities and also how that um, experience of immigration, of loss and other things can play into it as well. And so that is another opportunity to learn about Asian American history and to apply that to current people's experiences. And so whole people um, um, like that that's the extension of the Okada Tea House that still exists today, um, yeah. sharing food together. There's nothing like sharing food to bring <laughs> communities and cultures together. Um, and uh, a couple of questions have come in, um, I think, again, probably uh, that you could best address, Edwin, in terms of one kind of uh, from Andrew Young uh, along the lines of um, what being an Asian American who was not in a STEM major, um, you know, what that was like, uh, and um, uh, sort of what are the um, current cultural, or at least when you were a student, um, how have the Asian cultural classes, um, you know, are, are there more offerings like that? Uh, I know uh, Gloria and Jay kind of alluded to um, the absence of, of Asian cultural classes um, sort of at the beginning of, of their time as a student, but I don't know if you can comment on, on on if there are more or or not enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely share um, the um, the fact that there is an Asian American studies major is uh, an amazing thing. And um, there uh, is a belief that there should be more opportunities for Asian American studies classes on the campus and for um, more Asian American studies professors to be able to share their knowledge on Asian American history on the campus. Um, a few of my friends majored in Asian American studies, some who lived in Okada House, and 
Um, although they loved their time studying Asian American studies, there was that deep desire for more um, to explore. I believe um, there were uh, a few classes on Southeast Asian um, uh, Americans in particular, and the uh, one of the only Filipino American studies classes was actually a student initiated course that I helped teach for three years of my time at Stanford. And so as again, the demographic changes, um, there's a deep desire for more um, deeper dives into Asian American um, studies on campus. And as a psychology major on campus and someone who didn't major in STEM, I found that actually a lot of people in Okada House who uh, deeply engaged in the community also didn't um, study STEM as a major. And that um, gave me some comfort in knowing that um, I didn't have to go into a field that I wasn't passionate about. And I get to study psychology today in relation to my Asian American community and interests. And so having examples around me was a very great um, thing for me. As a fellow Asian fuzzy major, I was an English <laughs> major, I completely, <laughs> yes, I completely identify with that. Um, yeah, I just like to comment that yeah. um, there's been a, a real big push from the various alumni groups at, uh, of Asian Cent pushing to really um, have the university invest much strongly in Asian American studies. Basically, it's, it's been pretty dormant or stagnant for the last 50 years. There's only been a couple of classes. Although there's a minor, there's no real department. And so it's really hard to retain people who are tenure tracked and so on. So the university is finally beginning to realize that uh, it is important to start investing and in supporting Asian American studies. So they are hopefully going to be creating an institute for Asian American studies that will be uh, crossing over both undergraduate and graduate and through the different schools so that there's going to be much more robust program, hopefully in the near future. And it's, and it's kind of sad because when you think of how many Asian Americans, when we first started it, we're going like, you know, 100 and now there's, you know, close to 4,000 or something like that. And and so it hasn't proportionally increased. And so that's one area that I think the university has been lacking in development of Asian American studies. Great, thank you for, for adding that on. Uh, I know that's been a really important discussion around campus um, recently. Uh, let's see, we have um, a few more comments that have come in. Uh, Nelson Nagai says he just wants to say hi to Jay and Gloria and glad to meet Lee and Edwin. <laughs> um, no, no boys, he says, had many reasons to answer the way they did. Parents may have pressured sons to say no. Others had brothers who were in the army, Japanese army, and did not want to fight them. Um, and others still said no as protest to the concentration camps. Um, so yes, uh, thank you for that um, additional information, Nelson. Uh, Ken Ju also um, has a comment about uh, participating in intramural sports. He remembers JRA as a powerhouse, um, which he remembers stood for a Unipero Ringers Association. Um, when, he, when we played against them, my team from Robley Hall was overwhelmed. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, there's a question. Um, uh, a couple of questions coming in about, uh, and Jay, you uh, mentioned this in your presentation, uh, sort of the alliance or the example that was set by the Black and, and Chicano student um, organizations uh, prior to the establishment of ASA. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to comment on how the Okada experience compared um, to the theme houses uh, for those communities that were developed later. Um, was there any initial conflict what, um, you know, between these communities or, or, or a cooperation that happened between them that you're aware of? I really don't know. I mean, I know that, um, that in Robley, the part of it was the uh, uh, Black um, theme, but it didn't seem to be a cohesive group because it's was, it was, it was a smaller segment in a much bigger population. So I think Unipro with about 100 people was the perfect size um, for people to really feel that it was encompassed through uh, with all of the um, residents. So that's the only thing that I know of. I haven't really talked to anybody about their experiences in the other theme houses, so I really don't know. 
<laughs> but I mean, I think yeah. from uh, when I was talking to Edwin, it sounds like there is a really big demand to be in Okada House and that people really want to be in, in Okada House. And it's, it's, I mean, I, off the top of my head, I was thinking, well, why can't it get bigger or other, you know, so. Because <laughs> it, it has remained the same size for the past 50 years. Yeah, right. And as some people know, um, Okada House did shift dorms. Um, so it, it moved um, from its original housing in Unipero to it swapped with what was then known as Madeira. Um, and that happened in... I think it was uh, the fall of 1993, um, if I'm not mistaken. And, and part of the reasoning for that at the time, I think, had to do with the uh, availability of um, accessible bathrooms uh, for students. And so that was part of the reasoning. I don't know if it actually meant that there were more uh, dorm rooms for students in the new, in you know, what became the new Okada house. Um, but yeah, it's, it wasn't always uh, in Unipro. Um, we have, let's see, a question about, it uh, looks like someone who is going to be a resident. Um, I will be, this is from Eli Tostado, I will be in a non-binary dorm at Okada, and I'm wondering how I can best engage with an LGBTQ Okada experience combining Asian American experiences with that of the LGBTQ community. Um, Edwin, I don't know if you can help answer that from your experience there. Yes, I'd love to. And so that was uh, a big focus for um, my time in Okada House to make sure that we provided programming on the uh, LGBTQ plus and Asian American experience, um, given the um, deep tensions with uh, different cultural values that parents and um, ancestors might have, and um, to provide those opportunities on campus. The um, I'm hoping that, and I believe in your uh, current staff or upcoming staff and their ability to provide those opportunities. And I believe there's a student group on campus that should be um, still um, there now uh, called Queer and Asian that um, uh, you should look into. And I believe that they, um, their goal again is to talk about that intersection and to uh, engage with um, those cultural tensions, but also find the joy in being together. And um, I really encourage you to speak with your Ethic Theme Associates and staff members to provide those experiences and also engage with some of the Bay Area resources. Um, I'm blanking right now on one of the um, uh, organizations based in San Francisco focused on queer and Asian American um, experiences and organizing I will, um, it'll come back to me and I'll come back with y'all, with y'all for that, but um, hoping that those uh, experiences can help. Great, thank you, Edwin. Um, well, I think uh, we have time for just one question, one last question um, from an audience member that I think would be great for all of you to answer. Um, this comes from Lexi Maltzman. Uh, we are currently in a class of 12 Stanford undergrads in a sophomore college on belonging and identity at Stanford. If you could go back to your sophomore self, what would you want to tell uh, them that you didn't know then? Uh, we'll just start with Jay. Okay, so my sophomore self, and I guess whether it was the sophomore slump. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would say that was the beginning of when uh, ASA started. And so then I was able to find a group of people that kind of developed my leadership skills, um, working with a group of students. And so that really showed me how important it was to be able to work with people to move things forward. So I think uh, the collaborative cooperative skills that I developed working with people in order to create um, things that supported people. I think uh, for, I think one of the most important things I would say as is developing your network and developing um, who you know, because these will probably help you both in your personal and career life is the network that you're going to be creating at Stanford. And it does really have a huge impact on how you uh, work with other people. And also it does lead to lots of different pathways and avenues of how you can move forward with your life. 
Thanks, Jay. Gloria? Um, well, I think there are two things that come to mind. One is um, explore, explore, explore. Try things, try as much as you can. And, you know, um, one of the things I admire about Jay is his entrepreneurial spirit. And I think for me, I have to push myself to go out and try a lot of different things. And so that's really important. Um, the, other, the other thing that I would have told my sophomore self is, um, it's okay not to always be on top of everything. And that when you fall down, you pick yourself up and you say, okay, what's the next step? I'm talking like a psychologist, but I really believe this. And I actually um, tell my children this and I tell that to myself at times. So I think that, that in addition to exploring, be prepared that not everything is gonna always be the way you think it ought to go. And you just pick yourself up and you say, what is the next step? Um, and like Jay said, you find people that can support you in that, um, where you can actually share and be vulnerable and learn. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Gloria. Lee? Well, uh, going back to my sophomore self is a long time ago, uh, but um, I, I think uh, maybe I'm talking about more of what I learned uh, from these experiences. And I agree with the things that Jay and Gloria both said, but um, I think especially at Unipro, uh, what I learned and which has helped me throughout all of my life in dealing with lots of different people is to um, just take every person that you interact with as an, as an individual and unique person and don't start thinking about them as part of a group, whatever that group might be, whether it's a racial group, where they're from geographically, what language they speak, their sexual orientation, what religion they are, just, you know, if you can put those things aside and just interact with people as the way they are, um, it's, I think it's just the most rewarding way to deal with people and it's also the way you can really connect with people and um, I think that's something that I learned um, a lot at Unipro and throughout my Stanford experience. Thanks Lee and Edwin you don't have to think back too far <laughs> to your sophomore year but is there anything you would tell your sophomore self? Yes um, one thing I would tell myself and um, it's something that I found lots of opportunities to do, but would love more of is to find opportunities to get off campus and to learn more about the um, amazing and diverse and um, changing community of the Bay Area. Um, one such way that um, I would have loved more opportunities to do that is with uh, another beloved program of mine during my time um, called ASB or Alternative Spring Break. And um, that provided me with opportunities to um, learn more about Filipino American community organizations all across California. And there's also an Asian American identity alternative spring break to learn more, the, more about the Asian American community organizations. And so get the opportunities to get off campus and apply what you're learning on the ground and see how people who live in the Bay Area, Bay Area uh, understand Asian American identity as well, so that your experience can also be as well-rounded as um, it can be. Uh, one last point also, the, the queer uh, Asian American organization is called Lavender Phoenix for mm. Eli. So um, be sure to look out for their internship and other opportunities. Great. Well, so Lexi, hopefully that, uh, that helps your class um, answer some questions and, and things that you can look forward to. Um, on behalf of the Stanford Historical Society and the Stanford Asian Pacific American Alumni Club, uh, thank you all of you, Jay, Gloria, Lee, and Edwin for taking the time to share insights with us today. Uh, thank you also to our audience for joining us and for your thoughtful questions. Um, again, to our Historical Society members, your continued support makes what we do possible and we are incredibly grateful. Uh, we'll send all of you a survey by email in the coming days and we welcome any feedback or comments you may have about this program or ideas for future program topics on Stanford history. That email will also have some links um, or um, perhaps when we send out the link to the recording, um, which may take a couple of weeks, we'll share some links to other resources 
on Okada House um, and the Asian American Pacific Islander history at Stanford. Um, there was a, a fabulous website that was put together by the Okada House 2021 group um, in celebration of Okada House's 50th anniversary last year. So we can share the link to that. Um, there's some great resources, past daily articles and a timeline of API history at Stanford. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us and thank you to the audience for uh, participating and we wish you all a very pleasant rest of your evening. Thank you.